Good morning, good evening. Welcome everyone to Financing the Future, reporting on financial instruments to protect coastal communities. My name is Lucia Noel. I'm a coastal resilience thematic expert with Earth Journalism Network. For those of you who may be new to Earth Journalism Network or EJN, it has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism on environmental topics. EJN does this by helping journalists around the world report on climate change, biodiversity, conservation, pollution, and other issues through grants, fellowships, and other kinds of support. EJN is also a community of more than 14,000 journalists in 180 countries. If you're not a member and you would like to be one, please visit earthjournalism.net. By registering, you'll be the first to hear about grants, fellowships, workshops, and events like this webinar. Today's topic is designed for journalists uh, interested in reporting about climate and conservation finance. Marine and coastal ecosystems provide extremely valuable ecosystem services to coastal communities, but these benefits are increasingly under threat as climate change accelerates sea level rise, coastal erosion, saltwater intrusion, among other threats. And while there are some promising solutions, the question remains, how are we going to pay for them? especially in communities and countries with limited access to funding. There are innovative financial instruments in development and already in use designed to lighten the burden for coastal communities and provide a path toward resilience. These instruments include things like debt for nature swaps, environmental impact bonds, insurance schemes, and more. And you don't need a PhD in economics to report on these solutions. Here today to help us make sense of conservation finance strategies, we have a number of experts. First up, we will have Yabonex Batista. He is a deputy head of the UN Global Team for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. He has over 20 years of experience and is focused on sustainable financing, government relations, policy, protected areas, and climate change adaptation. Um, his extensive experience includes small island developing states, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Africa. Prior to joining GFCR, Yaba was the CEO for the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. Previous experience includes working with the German Government Technical Cooperation Agency in Mexico, the Nature Conservancy's International Government Relations Department, the World Bank, the U.S. Geological Survey, Amazon Environmental Research Institute in Brazil. Yaba holds a uh, master's in environmental relations and environmental in international relations and environmental policy. After Yaba, we will hear from Peter Christensen and Maji um, Sek. Peter is the lead environmental specialist in the uh, Environment Nat Natural Resources Global Practice at the World Bank Group. He is the program manager for the West Africa Coastal Areas Management Program and is also responsible for projects in fisheries, coastal zone management, and climate change. Mr. Christensen has previously worked on oceans at a global level, on multi-sector approaches to development in West Africa, on projects on toxic waste, pest control, strategic environmental assessments, and climate change. He has worked in Africa, Latin America, and Asia Pacific. Mr. Christensen is a Danish national and has previously worked with Conservation International, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. He holds a Master's of Science in Geo Geology with a specialization in coastal geomorphology. Peter will be joined by Maji Sek, Senior Partnership Specialist of the World Bank Environmental, Natural Resources, and Blue Economy for Africa. She manages communications, outreach, partnerships for the various projects. She's trained in journalism and communications and is from Senegal. And finally, we will have Megan Rowling. Uh, she is the Just Transition Editor for Thomas Reuters Foundation based in Barcelona. She specializes in international climate policy and climate finance and started TRS climate coverage more than 15 years ago. She has also worked for Reuters TV and BBC, as well as writing for many print publications. Um, before we begin with our first speaker, Yaba, I just wanted to remind everyone this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to rewatch on the EJN website in the next few days, and all registered attendees will receive an email notification when that's ready. Following the presentations, we will open it up to audience questions. Um, for those who are watching live, please make sure you type uh, your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, not into the chat box. Uh, we do have a, a tech person who will be um, helping out with this and reminding you. 
I will be monitoring the Q&A section once we reach um, questions, but we will not be monitoring the chat for questions. So make sure you put it into the Q&A. Uh, so uh, enough of that. Um, for now, we will hand over to our first presenter, Yaba Batista. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucien. And um, thank you to Earth Journalism for the opportunity to be with, with you today. Good morning, good evening um, to all the attendees. And also it's a pleasure to be here with my co-panelists. Um, as Lucien already mentioned, I'm Jaban X Batista. Uh, everybody calls me Jaba. Feel free to do so during the webinar. And I work for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. Um, Lucien was mentioning during the introduction um, the importance of how we are going to finance conservation into the future. And that's exactly the role that the Global Fund for Coral Reefs or the GFCR has with a specific focus on this very important ecosystem. And to provide some initial background on, on the importance of this ecosystem, it's, in, it's important for us to, to remind ourselves that coral reefs are essential for life on Earth. They are not only an ecosystem, they are actually a life system. They harbor 25% of all marine biodiversity in the world. They are literally an economic engine supporting the tourism industry, supporting the food industry. They support employment through those two sectors, for example. They also provide important um, <clears throat> contributions to, to medicine. And very importantly, with um, climate change, they are also part of the natural barriers that we have to um, address the impacts of climate change. But coral reefs are very much under peril. Um, between now and the next 30 years, we can potentially lose 90% of the coral reefs that remain on Earth. We have already lost. 14% um, in, in the last few decades. And not only is this ecosystem threatened, we don't have enough financial resources to really um, conduct effective conservation now and into the future for reef ecosystems. According to some studies, there's actually a, seven, uh, uh, a gap of seven times the amount of resources needed to fund coral reefs. And that's where the Global Fund for Coral Reefs comes in. We are a very different or you could say unique um, solution. We work through the model of blended finance and blended finance basically refers to the use of grant resources to then attract um, private sector resources so that we can have a larger pie of resources in this case to put towards reef conservation. And why this is important? Because during the last 30 years since the Rio conventions actually took hold the Convention on Biological Diversity, Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on, um, to Combat Desertification, the world has been focusing on using grants as one of the main, if not the main mechanism to fund conservation activities. And we already know that grant funding is not enough, that we do need the private sector to come um, and also be a force for nature. Um, and I think this is one of the one of the areas where, where I think um, um, when I participate in webinars like this one and I, and I talk with colleagues from, from the media, I always emphasize this. This is not something that, again, we can do with grants only. We really need the private sector to come into the picture with a lot of force because the businesses um, that they have also depend on these ecosystems. <clears throat> so what do we do exactly in the GFCR? We are a global coalition of public and private partners, um, and we are dedicated to closing the funding gap for coral reefs that I mentioned below. We work on creating what we call is a reef positive investment ecosystem, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that in, in, a, in a little while. But very importantly, all of our work is also science based. Every action, every program that we finance is based on a number of studies that have already identified which are the most resilient reefs around the world and why this is important. Because these resilient reefs, if we don't protect them, we, we, are, we are not gonna have a fighting chance against climate change and the other drivers of degradation. So these resilient reefs in many ways, 
they serve as reef banks. They are going to be the ones that are going to help us um, populate reefs into the future and be able to bounce back um, if they have the proper conditions. Um, this next slide is, is a representation of this growing coalition of the GFCR. We are supported by governments like the United Kingdom, Germany, France, um, Canada, the United States. We work um, with UN agencies. In fact, um, three UN agencies, UNDP, um, the UN Environment Program and the UN Capital Development Fund, along with the Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation and the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation are the founding institutions of the GFCR, um, which was launched originally in September 2020. And you can see how in only um, two and a half years, this coalition has really grown to bring together civil society, um, coral nation governments, um, additional partners from the private sector and other funders. So it is, it is really it is really important in our approach to work in partnership because all of us will need to do our part to save reefs for the future. <clears throat> all of our work is um, based and um, geared toward accomplishing this theory of change or, or what we would call also our desired change. As I, as I said before, we work on closing the, the um, coral reef conservation finance gap but the ultimate objective and our ultimate desire is to actually prevent extinction of this ecosystem by, by providing um, financial resources and doing our part of the work. This, this desire change is based on four pillars. The first one, um, as I said before, we focus on protecting the most resilient reefs around the world. Second, we focus on transforming those activities that are negative to, to, to coral reefs and we turn them into reef positive activities. So under this pillar is where we actually work a lot on, on addressing drivers of reef degradation, like um, unsustainable agriculture, unsustainable um, fishing. Um, and we also address things like um, lack of financial resources. But we know that protecting coral reefs is not gonna be the only thing that we need to do to give a fighting chance um, to this ecosystem. We also need to work on restoration. Um, restoration of coral reefs is um, it's an emerging topic still in many ways, and there are several technologies that are being tested um, to see what are, what are the best options for restoring these ecosystems. So in our approach, we are sure actually work in parallel on protection and restoration of coral reefs. And these two um, um, approaches actually have a lot of synergies. But all of this cannot happen if we don't take local communities into account. And that's why our fourth pillar is called the recovery pillar. It focuses on ensuring that we can build resilient communities um, to, to major shocks, including climate change and also things like the um, global pandemic of, of COVID. This is, in a, in a summarized way, our reef positive investment ecosystem. And, and I'm going to explain here how we work. Our coalition right now includes two main instruments. We have a grant fund that is managed and sits within the United Nations, and that's where, where I sit. Um, we use these grant resources and we deploy them as technical assistance or concessional loans or guarantees to help de-risk and build enabling conditions for creating what we call our reef positive businesses or reef positive financial mechanisms. Once we, we create that enabling condition, it is easier for the private sector to come into the picture. And that's the other side of this coalition and the other instrument that we have. We have an investment fund as part of the coalition that is managed by Pegasus Capital Advisor, which is an, um, an asset firm, um, asset manager firm out of New York and Connecticut. And they are looking at making investments of $10 million and upwards in developing sustainable businesses in the areas of ocean production, which includes sustainable mariculture, agriculture, fisheries, also hospitality with a focus, of course, on ecotourism around marine resources and circular economy and waste management, including plastic waste management and wastewater management. Um, in addition to this, through this reef investment ecosystem, we are also going to be creating partnerships with our other private sector actors that are also interested in building reef positive businesses, but that perhaps require 
uh, a smaller type of investment, so below the $10 million mark. So we are working with different partners already um, to see what are those opportunities. And to summarize and finalize with this slide, um, again, our reef positive solutions, we can, we can group them into, into the sustainable ocean production, into ecotourism, into circular economy and, and waste management. But in addition to that, we're also building and help build financial mechanisms um, that can generate new resources for coral reef conservation. And, and the likes of these are the ones already mentioned, for example, by Lucien, um, we can support debt swaps. We are working on reef insurance mechanisms. We are supporting blue carbon schemes um, and blue carbon credits um, schemes in general. We're also exploring um, with partners the creation of biodiversity credits or coral reef credits um, as well. Just to give you a glimpse on where we work <clears throat> from the grant fund side. So where, where are we working already on building the enabling conditions to create these reef positive businesses? As you can see, we work around the world. Uh, we have a growing portfolio um, between programs that are currently under implementation or in development um, that encompass Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Pacific Islands and Asia Pacific. As you can see, we have a strong focus on small island development states and least developed countries. Um, these two groups together um, encompass 61% of our portfolio and most of our portfolio, um, of course, is, is um, countries that receive official development assistance from, from donor governments. So this is, this is really our, <clears throat> our geographic focus. These are um, uh, only a slice of the most important coral reefs countries around the world. And with that, I would like to, to stop um, now for my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Back to you, Lucien. Thank you so much, Eva. That was an excellent sort of case study of a, a positive example. Um, we're going to turn it over now to Peter, uh, who is joined by Maji. Thank you very much, uh, Lucien, and thank you, uh, Jabanex, for that um, uh, comprehensive presentation of your of your program. It's really impressive, and many of the things that you are presenting there are, um, are, are, are alike to uh, the programs we have uh, at the World Bank. And today I will be speaking about the West Africa Coastal Areas Management Program. So the, the task for this webinar was to talk a bit about the financing uh, instruments we have and also how it links into um, reporting and public accountability. So that is what we chose to uh, present here. So Maji, if you can put the slide in full page. So the image here on the cover of the slides is uh, from coast of West Africa from Senegal. And you see that the ocean has reached uh, a house where a family lives. There's a child on the floor uh, sleeping there. And this is the visible uh, effect of coastal erosion and which sparked the mission of the Waka program back uh, at COP21 to find a way to assist countries in managing their coastline sustainably. It was specifically requested by Benin and Togo uh, in those countries, uh, the uh, coast is retreating between five and 10 meters per year in certain areas. And um, they are, the people are losing not only their houses, but also their livelihoods, because as the ocean erodes the beach, you also have an exposure of rocks that prevents fishermen from taking their boats out and many other livelihood activities that are affected. So uh, let me tell you a bit about uh, how we set up this program. So on this slide here, you will see that we took a regional uh, approach in West Africa. So the coast from Mauritania to Gabon. And within this, uh, we felt that there was a need to um, assist with the overall resilience and, and uh, specifically uh, on the uh, management of the shoreline and the success measure is the number of households that are less exposed to coastal erosion, flooding, and pollution. The um, World Bank provides finance to, to countries, but can also finance regional institutions. So we did a combination here of national projects. So the box lower to the lower left, 
So we have nine countries underway right now with a total of a bit over half a billion dollars in investment projects. So the projects range from um, about 25 million to 60 million per country. And in addition, we have a platform uh, of collaboration that uh, works on new knowledge, on new financing instruments, and on, on dialogue and engagement. And there, um, similar to what uh, Yavanex explained, it is really important that each of the partners that are willing to work on coastal issues in West Africa, that we form partnerships, that we figure out how one donor or one technical partner can better uh, contribute their part um, and then thereby have an economies of scale and better coordination, more rapid action and better impact. So France, Japan, Netherlands and Nordic Development Funds were with us from the start back in 2018. And then in this case, for the economies of scale and common policy and overall coordination and also for the transformational impact of the program because we want everything we do on coastal erosion, flooding and pollution to be embedded and have better planning in each of the countries. So for that, the common policy measures provided by the West Africa Economic and Monetary Union, so that's WAIMU, and the um, Economic Commission for, for West Africa, ECOWAS, and the Central um, Economic Central Africa Economic Commission, CESC, uh, provide a, a framework of collaboration with each of the grouping of countries that are members of their economic commissions. And then in addition, we work with the UNEP's uh, Abidjan Convention. This is a regional seas convention that also has protocols on mangroves, coastal zone management, uh, oil and gas and pollution. And very importantly, um, there is one organization in Senegal that works on coastal monitoring, the Centre de Suivi Ecologique, that has been operational for about 20 years and uh, has uh, led the GIS mapping of the whole coast. And since then, it's been enhanced with um, uh, satellite imagery, risk assessments, solutions. So for every stretch of coast in West Africa, you have uh, an action plan as part of the shoreline management scheme. So this kind of regional approach uh, has worked really well. We already have uh, thousands of households that are less exposed to coastal erosion and is one of the flagship programs in the World Bank that is now being replicated uh, elsewhere and also uh, scaled up to uh, Africa overall. The next slide, please. So here you see a, a visual uh, uh, presentation of some of the things that, that we do in the program. The upper left is not the WACA project, but another tourism project of the World Bank in Senegal that, that provided the protection of the shoreline with uh, wave barriers and groins and beach nourishment. And that has enabled to secure the private sector tourism industry in that area and also secure the access of the uh, fishermen to the sea. In the middle of the top, you see in Mauritania a dune stabilization using nature-based solutions. Um, in case you don't know it, Nouakchott, the capital of uh, Mauritania, is actually under the sea level. And you have a network of, of coastal dunes that are protecting and preventing the flooding of the city. And if these dunes disappear, you have a fully flooded capital. So therefore, fixation of the dunes where you put in uh, twigs and branches um, in a pattern um, helps uh, protect and retain the sand uh, grain on the dunes so they don't disappear. On the upper right, you see a traditional groin uh, used to um, prevent the coastal erosion in Benin. This is a very common uh, coastal protection method that is applied uh, all over the world, including in my own country, Denmark, for over 100 years. So in addition to the coastal protection the projects also include social uh, sub-projects, so uh, to help communities restore and, and have livelihoods. And to the lower left, you see some example of uh, uh, coconut uh, oil production and, uh, and other social sub-projects. And as part of the bank's environmental and social framework, um, it's also uh, required for, for countries and for our projects to respect uh, cultural properties. And you see in the lower image from Benin, lower right, how um, we have uh, helped the communities undertake their traditional ceremony of prayer before the beach is restored. 
So that gives you a bit of a spectrum of, of the kind of things we do. There's much more on our website, uh, wakaprogram.org that you will see. But now to the finance. So what kind of finance does the World Bank provide? I know for many people, the World Bank is a big uh, institution that's hard to penetrate, but uh, it is, um, it is a, 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 um, an accessible uh, organization. You can be in touch with team leaders like myself or Maji and many others. You can search on, on countries. If you go to World Bank, um, if you search a World Bank projects, you can go in and look for each country what uh what the world bank is financing the strategy you can go into each each project and also see who's the team leader like myself so if you go in on the waka a search on waka on the world bank website you will find my name and you can just call me if you have any questions or you can call any other team leader you'd like to get in hold, hold of that is responsible for world bank projects so what kind of finance does the world bank provide well we have four sub institutions that you may know the IBID, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, IDA, which is the International Development Association. Then we have IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm. And we have MIGA, which is the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Association. So in each of these uh, sub-institutions, uh, there's different instruments. I work on the IDA part of the World Bank. And um, so we provide... The example I gave was investment project finance for the WACA program, and that can be either grant money or it can be credit, which are subsidized uh, loans. Uh, we also have development policy uh, finance where countries are, let's say, rewarded from passing a particular policy on pollution or coastal protection. So once they have completed action, uh, the, the activity is financed. And the same with project for result. This is a as an example, when you build a road, uh, they will be paid for the road once that's been completed uh, or sections have been completed. And then we have private sector equity. So the IFC is providing that uh, to, uh, to certain companies where there's a, um, a profit, a profitability and sustainability element. Um, and they normally come in with other uh, investors um, and their website, you will see uh, many projects they do on, on sustainable ports and other areas. And then the risk guarantee, this is basically to enable um, areas or projects that are at higher risk to have a way out if things go wrong. Uh, to the right um, is a, a diagram. I don't, you don't need to read it now, not right now, but it is in that publication that's called Financing Options and Instruments which is a new um, paper that, uh, that I wrote with a few colleagues for COP27. And you can find it on this website, worldbank.org forward slash, slash BE for wrap, lowercase. Um, and um, there you will find uh, this graphic that is, I think is really helpful because it tells you uh, when it is possible to get the private sector financing because for our purposes of coastal protection, private sector would not come in and just finance a coastal protection because there's no revenue from it. It's not revenue generating. So that's why public finance is mostly needed for these kind of, um, of, of areas. But go in and look at this one because there's other instruments as well um, that can be identified there. I want to just touch uh, uh, briefly on the innovative instruments as we call them. Um, so blue carbon, for that one, we actually came on with the first uh, blue carbon deal for the World Bank in Africa in Ghana, uh, protecting uh, 3,000 hectares of um, mangrove for a 20-year period, um, uh, providing, uh, uh, I think it's 15, 14 or $15 million for that 20-year 20, um, 20 period uh, for communities to protect and manage their, their mangroves. Blue carbon is not a new concept, but what was new here is that we made this deal happen within three months. And it was without middlemen, it was with one uh, sustainable energy company in Europe that say, we want to go right, right in and do this uh, and make it quickly. And they want to do more of them. So there's, there's some uh, innovation to do within the innovative uh, instruments about how we do it so we can get the speed and scale uh, underway. 
blue-green bonds and endowment funds and depth swaps are all described in this uh, paper that is on the slide here. And so with that, uh, I'm going to pass the microphone to my colleague, Maggi, who will talk about how we engage um, the journalism uh, networks in the region. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maggi Gensek. I'm from, from Senegal. Uh, I joined the bank after a training in communication and after working for the Voice of America. So, of course, I uh, my job is really to push technical people like Peter and remind them, OK, my colleagues are there. We need journalists. We need to bring them in the project. We need them to help us spark public accountability. And that's why really uh, in many of our projects, especially on this Sawaka project, we make sure that uh, journalists are included. Uh, what do we do with the journalists? What is the objective? The objective is really to make sure that journalists are informed about these environmental challenges. What are the challenges? What are, what are the issues? Uh, what are the solutions? Uh, help them get the right numbers. Often journalists at the session will say, you know, you know, we don't know where to go. Where, where are the right numbers? Where are the right stats? So what we do is make sure that we give them uh, a website with uh, results, recommendations from our studies, and work with the journalists on creating an enabling environment for reforms. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, a few years ago, uh, with our Sustainable Fisheries Project, we uh, partner with the Nordic Development Fund and the African Union actually to build a network of over 100 journalists, journalists from print, online, even cartoonists were, 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 were included in these journalists. And the, the purpose is really to mobilize them, train them, meet with them, give them the right tools uh, to uh, be the right journalist. Uh, another example, like in this WACA project, now we are in nine countries, in each, for, in each country, we have a communication specialist who design a communication plan. And in that, we always make sure that there are activities specific for journalists. What do we do? Uh, we do periodic briefing to tell them about the advance of the project. We do training on issues. We sign agreements or different convention with the media to make sure that they are on board and they follow the project. Uh, we don't only work with um, <clears throat> we don't only work with uh, with journalists uh, from Africa. We also work with uh, with, with other journalists. Uh, I'll I'll give you an example. Uh, a few months ago, I traveled to Senegal and the Gambia to document how plastic is invading livelihoods. Why did we do that? Because we do reports, we do analytical work, but beyond that, we need to bring the human and artistic, the human narrative. When we talk about plastic, when we talk about coastal erosion, like in this picture, this is actually in my village. I was born in this village. This is a mom and a son who lost half of their home, but they still, they still live there. They still sleep there. And every night they're waiting to say, okay, is this the night where the sea will carry us away? This is the type of reporting that you bring on top of the analytical work. And we work with photojournalists to document this kind of, uh, uh, to, to, to bring this kind of visual that really shock people and trigger them into action. The other one is a work we did with a photojournalist from New York. It's a photojournalist who's well known, Mel D. Cole, who did the Black Lives Matter. We traveled together to document plastic. And again, the, the idea is really to bring these really powerful images to go with the analytical work that you produce. Let me give you maybe another example that, 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 that can many of you can relate to uh, as radio journalists. In the WACA, we created the Radio de Littoral, which is the radio of the coast. What does it do? We really use the radio for social engineering. We need people, we need stakeholders, but what do we do? We created this radio that is produced in the villages. If, if, if we have a village on the coast is doing like mangrove restoration, we will move the radio from the capital because usually the radio is produced at national level in the capital. But in our case, what we do, 
we have actually a group of 10 journalists moving around the country each month to produce a show in the village, in the local language, with the whole community there, with a microphone, they can walk up, they can ask any question they want and get answers. And this, this radio started in Senegal, now we are in six countries, and it has really allowed us to, to understand people, what they do, what are they, what, what do they want, what do they think, what, what don't they know that we could clarify. And, you know, having a feedback loop has really helped us adjust our moves, you know, are we going the right way, should we do, you know, a social project like, like Peter showed earlier, and, and this it, with, with the advent of the COVID and the social media, I mean, the, the, this radio has been really ampli been amplified. We have WhatsApp groups with fishermen, with geologists uh, uh, who, who, who chat, who, who talk, and who use now this radio as really a platform for knowledge sharing, for capacity building. So this is uh, what we do with, with journalists from Africa, but also from, from the US, from Europe, to make sure that beyond the numbers, we have a human narrative. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Maji. Um, we will now pass the mic over to our final speaker, which is Megan. Hi, everybody. Hello, hi. Um, thanks for joining this afternoon. So, um, uh, I think uh, we have a great segue um, from uh, the World Bank to um, what I was going to talk about, um, because, um, as you said, for us, uh, the key thing um, is to focus on the human narrative um, and to always, uh, you know, try and show uh, what the dollars are, are doing for, for people on the ground. So, um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen as I have a few slides as well um, and uh, just talk you through a little bit uh, some of the work that we've done at the Thomson Reuters Foundation um, on climate finance and specifically um, as it relates to, uh, to coastal projects. Um, just to clarify, um, we're not a foundation in the normal sense of, of giving out money. We are basically the... Um, uh, charitable part of Reuters News. Um, so we also, as well as doing our own journalism, uh, we have a team of about 50 correspondents around the world, um, uh, all, all different parts of the world, less so in, in West Africa um, at the moment. We did have somebody in Senegal, but now we only have somebody in Nigeria. So we're not huge, um, but we do have a global network. Um, and uh, our focus is um, on climate change, uh, inclusive economies, and how tech interacts with society. You can see those three subjects um, at the top of our website there, uh, which was rebranded last year uh, and is now called Context. Um, but this is the website of the Thompson Reuters Foundation. I don't know if some of the people on this webinar may also have come across our training courses. Um, we train journalists um, around the world in a, in a range of topics, um, everything from in the past humanitarian use, disaster coverage, trafficking and slavery, um, just transition and many other subjects, um, especially in developing countries. Um, and I think in the vast majority of cases, the trainings are, are offered for free. Um, so uh, I was just going to talk you through a little bit um, how we've covered coastal climate finance um, uh, in the, well, more than 15 years that we've been covering climate change now. Um, I would say that coastal climate finance stories are something that have only really kind of come to the fore uh, in the last few years um, because this is a relatively uh, new area, although obviously um, as Manji Peter and Yara have said, there's, there's lots of exciting stuff going on. So I just wanted to show you a few of the stories that we've done. I, I can't really show you the whole thing. It's just some headlines here. So you can see 
um, the types of thing uh, that we've covered under what I would describe as coastal climate finance. And one thing I think is worth noticing is that a lot of the headlines don't actually have finance in anywhere in the, in the title. Um, uh, in the headline, a couple of them do. Um, this is a, a recent story um, uh, about how uh, mangrove restoration could help uh, local people in, in Indonesia um, uh, and was a look at how uh, a different approach being led by Wetlands International in Indonesia, which is not about planting new trees, um, what they did uh, had, was go to different parts um, and look at where uh, mangroves could successfully be restored and regrown naturally, um, given the right kind of protection for the ecosystem and the right mix of livelihoods in the local area. So this was a kind of new approach um, that was funded by uh, Wetlands International. I think they're hoping to scale this up um, in different parts of Indonesia and coastal Southeast Asia. Um, this story, another mangrove related one, but in Malaysia um, actually has finance uh, in the title, um, in the headline. Um, and this was a story about how um, local fishermen were basically trying to raise money um, from local corporations who would pay just like a couple of dollars um, per mangrove tree that these fishermen um, uh, were planting themselves. Um, and uh, my colleague Lee, uh, who was based in Malaysia at the time, went and spoke to the fishermen and the fishermen told her that even though um, this was working very well for them, they just were really struggling to, to get bigger amounts of finance um, and that they really had a problem when it came to applying for um, big money, so to speak, because of donor requirements and, and basically donors asking them to do much more than they could actually handle themselves. Um, so that this story was a real look at the, at the finance part of the puzzle. And then actually, um, this is great because after this story came out, I think about 10 different organizations and individuals um, con got in contact with these fishermen and offered to fund uh, their mangrove planting. And that included Nestle, um, which uh, offered to, uh, I think, plant about 10,000, uh, pay for them to plant 10,000 trees a year so that was a really nice example of how like covering something like this and really going into the nitty-gritty of the issues being faced by um, people on the ground can actually bring some nice results uh, and, and help uh, with their efforts um, so that was uh, another one this one uh, again Indonesia um, this was basically a story about um, a government, big government program to um, boost mangrove protection. Um, but as you can see, the headline doesn't say anything about finance, although obviously <laughs> the money was coming through from the government. This one focused on how um, uh, the protection for these mangroves was helping local women source dyes, dyes in order to create um, uh, fashion uh, garments, you know, uh, the, the dyes that they needed uh, for, for the textiles. And then actually, I think uh, some of these textiles were um, featured in a fashion show um, in the region and had won some uh, prizes for uh, their great designs. And again, this is a story about how it's helping the livelihoods of local women, but this time the money was coming from the government. Uh, this story that we did in 2018 is exactly uh, what uh, Maggie and Peter were talking about. This is a story that we did off the back of something I heard, I can't remember even where, but it was about the West Africa Coastal Management Programme of the World Bank that we've just been hearing about, but um, as you can see the date on that is 2018. Um, and so this is in the early days, I think, of, of the programme when it first started, um, and the story talks about uh, the trouble that people were experiencing in San Luis in, in Senegal with the, the coastal erosion, flooding, and it exactly begins, as Maggi was talking about, um, with a family um, uh, and uh, the flooding that they'd experienced in their home. And, and, and it starts with the mum telling how her, her child was sort of 
ran in and woke her up at night because the water was coming into the house and then goes on to talk about a government-led relocation um, program, which was a temporary one, but was, you know, uh, it was having some difficulties. It wasn't ideal, but then um, obviously WACA as well uh, was planning to help uh, with relocation for some communities as part of its activities, though obviously it covers a a whole lot more uh, activities as Peter was talking about. So this is what how we try to weave the problems that the people who were living in San Luis are facing um, with what the government was doing to help them on a temporary basis at the time, and then um, how there was going to be a bigger effort to help these people um, under the WACA program of the World Bank. So it's super interesting for me to hear how things are going uh, with that program. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's um, now I'm thinking how can we how can we cover this again? <laughs> um, and then this this is another story um, that we did about uh, I think it's the Global Mangrove Trust. Um, I think it's a nonprofit which was basically aiming to um, raise uh, finance uh, to plant mangroves through crowdfunding. Uh, website so that individuals like you or me um, could go onto this website and uh, uh, and pay to have um, mangroves planted. So I, I, I wanted to show you those different headlines um, because each of them re represents a different kind of funding, a different kind of climate finance uh, for coastal programs, ranging from you know individuals doing crowdfunding to big uh, donor programs to um, individual fishermen trying to raise the money from corporations on the ground. That and the point of showing you this is that just to to, to back up really the idea and the, and, the, and the reality that there are all kinds of different types of finance, different types of funding um, for for work that you can cover. Um, but the point is that these programs, you know, in the vast majority of cases, are not getting still enough funding, um, and you know they're looking for more finance, and um, that there's this connection between what decisions are being made at big UN conferences and at big institutions like the World Bank and then what individuals are, are kind of doing or trying to do on the ground. So, um, you know, coastal climate finance, I'd say for journalists is quite a niche area. Um, we wouldn't have anyone who's specifically uh, specialized in this area. Um, although, you know, we have focused on climate finance over the years. And as part of that, increasingly, I'd say um, that we're looking at um, uh, coastal finance. Um, and, you know, the reason for that is, is as you can see on my slide here, um, that, as I already mentioned, I'd say this is a relatively new subject on the political agenda, um, raising climate finance for, for coastal projects. Um, but there are obviously institutions um, and civil society groups that are specifically focused on it, but I'd say it's rising fast in terms of importance. So uh, especially after the COP15 um, global agreement, the new global, di uh, global biodiversity um, framework that was agreed in Montreal in December, um, and also the UN High Seas um, Treaty that we had just a couple of weeks ago, which is 20 years in the making. But the, the, the outcome of these agreements is that there is much more official focus on um, raising money because we have targets to meet, um, you know, which include 30 percent protection for uh, for coastal areas as part of the bigger goal on the 30 by 30 um, agreement to protect 30 percent of land and, and sea uh, of the in the entire planet. So coastal areas are specifically mentioned in, in the COP15 deal. So once we have these agreements in place, a bit like the Paris Agreement for Climate Change, then quite often what, what starts to happen is that money starts to flow um, in, in much bigger amounts. And you know, as part of the COP15 deal, um, I think the agreement was for 200, uh, sorry, I can't quite remember the amounts now, uh, 200 billion, I think, a year by 2030, coming from all sources, which includes government, business, um, and, and various other sources, and then also 
um, you know, we can see that in the, this decade, tens of billions of dollars per year are going to start to be unlocked for nature protection and coastal areas are a part of that. So that's donor money coming from bilateral donors like some of the rich countries or multilateral donors like the World Bank. And also, as you've heard, more corporations are interested in investing um, in these types of programs. Also insurance uh, for things like coral reefs. Um, Gemma mentioned, and also another area that's quite interesting, I think will be in, in future years is um, under COP15, it was also agreed that there will be at least 500 billion a year in harmful subsidies, subsidies that are hurting nature at the moment need to be redirected towards nature protection. So that's another source of finance in the future. Um, and, you know, why, why does this matter? Well, I don't need to explain that. I think our other speakers have already explained the importance of protecting coral reefs, mangroves, um, you know, whether that's uh, because they provide a whole range of services for humans, whether it's carbon storage or biodiversity um, protection, uh, clean water, um, the, the food that we eat uh, and the air that we breathe. So, so, so many important things. And I think uh, the work that is happening at the UN and research but among researchers as well to put a value on those services and put a price on blue carbon um, is, is moving along. And so those are areas that as journalists, we should also um, be keeping track of. So uh, where can you where can you look for story ideas? Well, I think it's pretty clear, uh, depending on where you're based, whether you're looking at the global level or the national level, you need to check for what big government and donor projects are ongoing or starting or, you know, you can uh, find out this type of information fairly easily. Um, you can also look at the websites of the big climate funds like the Green Climate Fund, uh, UN Development Programme, which are getting more and more involved in these types of, of uh, projects as well. Um, find out which NGOs are working on these projects at the national, the local level where you live. Um, and there are also community-led adaptation projects, um, which are pretty interesting as well, and can give a kind of different um, uh, type of uh, focus, really. Um, uh, and, and some of those are also being supported by, by the bigger funders as well. And then, like I already mentioned, there's crowdfunding, carbon credit schemes, um, those kind of things. So those are all, um, you know, different types of projects and programs that, that you can cover as, as a journalist. Um, and I don't think it's too hard to find information on those. I mean, for example, I just did a search on uh, here, you can see on the screen, uh, there was, um, I just searched on the Green Climate Fund website for coastal and a load of projects came up. So you can do that. They don't actually have a coastal climate finance section on the site, but it's really easy to find the types of programs and projects that they're financing. And then Climate Policy Initiative, which is another big um, organization that does research on climate finance they also have some good examples on, on their website as well so how to cover these types of stories well for us it's really important to put the people and the nature first and not the money so um obviously in an article we're going to be talking about where the money comes from how much money is involved um how the money is getting to people on the ground um, and what the aim of, of the bigger projects is, but we're not going to start our story by writing about that in the first few paragraphs, um, unless it's an announcement of a, a new fund or something we're writing as a news story. If we're writing features, um, we're going to be basically looking at, you know, the impact on people like Maggie was saying. Um, and so we will always start a... a the story um, with, you know, the fishermen talking or the people whose houses are being washed away talking, telling us about the situation, um, showing that situation with photos as well. So, I mean, in, in, as an editor, um, you know, I would suggest that you try to visit the project uh, or at least one of, one of, one of the project sites. Um, and talk and then talk to a range of actors involved in the project so that's the locals on the ground you talk to the donor people like Peter you know, uh, uh, talk to the implementing agencies 
And then also independent experts, we find this uh, very useful. So you can talk to researchers who may have been uh, involved in the programme or not involved, uh, which is also quite useful uh, to get um, a range of views and not just people who obviously its job is to, to promote the project and say how great it is. But <laughs> Also to, to talk to people who are experts in, in coastal restoration, um, but who, who may know of the project, but not directly involved in it. Um, obviously the size of the projects is important. Um, I mean, you know, clearly people want to hear about big projects like um, WACA um, because there's hundreds of millions of dollars involved. But I think, you know, as we found with climate change adaptation in the early days, um, we're also interested in covering small scale projects um, that could be scaled up and replicated because, you know, uh, nowadays we wouldn't do that so much with climate change adaptation because there's a lot of knowledge in that area. Um, and we wouldn't so much look at the small scale projects, but I think with coastal climate finance, because it's at an earlier stage, we, we would be interested in stories about, for example, the fishermen planting mangroves in Malaysia that I showed you before. Um, and I think, again, for us, it's not like there's this big project happening, so we need to cover it. It's like, what's different? What's new? Um, you know, why, why should we be writing about this? So for example, in the Indonesia um, one that I showed at the start, what was interesting uh, to, to me about this project was that it wasn't like, well, you know, how many mangroves are being planted um, in this place? It's like, oh, actually, no, with, with uh, wetlands is trying to do something different here because they're not uh, just trying to replant or plant mangroves. Um, they're trying to look at where the original mangroves can be regrown because they think that's a more sustainable approach um, to, to, to um, uh, protecting the mangroves and actually restoring the mangroves because they, they think that's more likely to be successful than just planting mangroves that don't necessarily um, end up uh, uh, staying because they die or because people don't treat them properly or they're not maintained or whatever. So that to me was, oh, that my ears pricked up there. And then obviously with the WACA program, it's huge. You know, it's ginormous and it has all these different elements to it. And looking at how those all um, interact and, uh, and, and following the progress of a program like that, um, which is really important to local people, um, is, is, is something worth uh, sort of revisiting four years or five years down the line for us, for example, now. And I think what's really important is to cover what's working with the program or the project, where some of it's the, the opportunities, but also the barriers, the challenges, what, what people on the ground are finding difficult to do. Um, so look at both the positive and the negative angles, because that when people read the story, that also helps funders and, and, and um, uh, organizations to, to evolve their methodologies and how they're doing things. And also we need to explain to the readers you know, why is this important? Why do we have to protect mangroves? Well, because they store carbon, because they help uh, buffer communities from storms, um, because of uh, the livelihoods opportunities, uh, such as the dyes for the women weavers and that kind of thing. So we need to explain um, the broader significance um, and then how does it fit into the wider picture of climate and nature action why does it matter well because we have this COP15 agreement we're supposed to be protecting 30 percent of coastal areas um, and uh, you know as well with with climate finance um, what is it aiming to achieve why does it matter um, whether it's adaptation or reducing emissions um, whatever that might be but I would just bring it back to saying uh, to the journalists who try not to lose sight of the local uh, elements of the story. Um, I think that's really important for readers uh, in terms of connecting this, this um, local and global um, kind of picture, their livelihoods, how that's helping them develop and how that's actually helping bring climate justice for them and enabling them to participate um, in, in the green economy. Uh, okay, so this is uh, who I am. Um, that's my email address. Um, if people on, on this webinar are interested in pitching freelance stories to Thompson Reuters Foundation slash context, um, you're welcome to get in touch with pitches about coastal climate finance uh, stories that you may have. I'm very willing to hear them. Uh, and yeah, we commission freelancers, um, but in order to um, help us understand what you're trying to write about, uh, need you to put those elements in the pitch, the top line, what's the angle, what is there a news peg, how you're going to report it, 
Um, who are you going to talk to? Can you get pictures? Can you get video? In some cases, we can also help with travel, um, but we're not like Pulitzer Centre, for example, who specifically have big grants for that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so uh, I hope that's helped in terms of understanding how we cover coastal climate finance and uh, happy to, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Megan. That was such a, an excellent and helpful uh, list of resources and recommendations for journalists. So appreciate that. We have about uh, 15 minutes left and quite a few questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to go through and uh, uh, ask some of these questions and, and, and point them towards uh, certain experts that I, I believe they were for. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, to start off, and um, perhaps I will ask this of uh, Yaba, the question was, uh, what are the most effective ways to engage private sector actors in financing projects aimed at protecting coastal ecosystems? So maybe just if you could talk a little bit about negotiating with private sector and what interests um, uh, they're most interested in. Toronto Yaba. Thank you. Thank you, Lucien. Um, and thank you to the person that, that provided that question. Um, let me let me pull it up again just to make sure. Yes, so I think I think there are several things that, that are important to keep in mind when engaging private sector in conservation, and I'll use, um, of course, the example of coral reefs um, and the blue economy in general. When we talk about attracting private sector to a sustainable blue economy, this is still a very nascent um, world. Um, the the private sector has not has not been used to this in the past, and there is a lot of risk um, from their perspective in investing in what we would call sustainable reef businesses or sustainable blue economy businesses. And what does this risk means for them is that they are not sure if they are going to have a return. So what we do in the GFCR is we, we lower that risk. Um, and we can do this, for example, by supporting the development of sustainable blue economy, sustainable reef positive businesses by um, providing technical assistance on developing the business models for these new kinds of businesses to be successful. So this is one of the ways in which we can then reassure the private sector actors that then there is a, an actual business model um, that, that can support their investment. When, when it comes to private sector, a second point is that when it comes to private sector um, engaging on conservation, uh, there are a lot of initiatives out there now that focus on what is the environmental and social impact that private sector should have on the environment and on people in a, in a, in a positive sense. <clears throat> so one of the things that the GFCR is doing is that we are actually about to launch a very comprehensive monitoring and evaluation framework, including very detailed indicators that cover environmental impact, social impact, and financial impact. Why, why is this important? Because when private sector actors come um, and they are interested already in, in having a positive um, effect, they want to know what is that effect. And they normally also now have to report on what are the positive effects that they are having on the environment. So if we don't provide the private sector with those monitoring and evaluation tools, this task is gonna be a lot more difficult for them. And at the same time, um, by providing them with a monitoring and evaluation toolkit, let's say, we actually entice them to continue to invest um, further. And then they, they, they will feel more comfortable also, again, for them, this is also about um, lowering, lowering the risk. So I think those would be um, two quick examples of how we can, we can support the engagement of private sector in conservation, Lucien. Thank you so much. Um, moving on, the next question, and I believe this is for Peter. Um, the question is, when it comes to financing sea defenses, are there funds or processes for communities downdrift from sea defenses um, where coastal erosion usually increases as, as a sea defense, um, as a result of the sea defense? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for that question. And it is spot on because um, the dynamics of the sediment on the beach is, uh, as you say, you, you put in protection, but then at the last downdrift, you have this turbulence happening and it will continue to erode. And what we did to prevent that 
problem to happen between Togo and Benin, so Benin is downdrift from Togo, um, is to uh, do a what we call a sand motor. So it is a, instead of the groins, the hard infrastructure, we use uh, the natural processes uh, of distributing sand along the beach. So in this case, you have a six kilometer wide along the beach and 400 meters um, uh, out to the sea where you pump up sediment so that it distributes itself down drift and protects the communities beyond the, uh, the hard infrastructure we've put in place. So I think, so that is on the, let's say the geophysical protection on the community development part of it, it is really, really hard because there's so many needs. And if I take that example again, historically population have migrated to the coast in West Africa. You have more youth, they've got lots of unemployment and there's less space to build and have population live. Urban areas are expanding. So it is really important in this case to uh, try and insert a community development um, program within the government's program. It is really the government that is responsible for making sure the coastline is stable, that there are the infrastructure needed for water, sanitation, toilets, and everything. And I think what we do at the World Bank with community-based project is to assist the governments in setting up systems for community-based development. So the World Bank has these kind of programs in various countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question, and I think this is general, so if anyone uh, wants to answer this, please feel free to jump in. I know Megan did discuss some sort of crowdfunding and smaller scale projects, um, but this question is, are financial instruments only for governments or private sector, and uh, can NGOs and individuals also approach climate funding? If yes, how? Um, are these instruments currently for some targeted countries only? Perhaps, yeah, we could start with Yaba and Peter, happy, if you have anything to add. Happy to, to start on <clears throat> answering this one. I mean, the, the question is very, very important and valid because every instrument um, out there, or every fund will probably have a, a different approach to this. In, in our case, um, our programs, um, for example, on the grant side of the GFCR coalition, are led, <clears throat> sorry, the development process and the design process is led by either a non-governmental organization or by a United Nations um, agency. However, through that process, we do bring a coalition of actors at the country level that includes government, civil society, and academic and research institutions as well. So um, in, in our case, the primary entry point, again, is a, a non-governmental organization or a UN agency. On the investment fund side, um, the ones that, that receive the investment, of course, is a, is a private sector entity, a, a company itself that will focus then on a sustainable or, or reef positive um, solution. For our geographic scope, I mentioned that we are currently working around 23 countries. This is um, so far our scope. We, we, don't, we have not decided yet where we might expand, but we do have um, a list of about 50 countries around the world that are the most important countries um, for coral reef ecosystems. So that's that's our universe, our, our geographic universe. And, and so far, we are aiming to work in about half of that um, portfolio of countries. Thank you. So if I can tag on to that, Lucien. So the World Bank provides financing to governments. So that is that is the primary way we do it. We have some smaller grant mechanism that can benefit uh, uh, civil society as well, but the majority is directly with governments. And that is exactly why it's so important for us to work in partnerships with civil society and other donors that can provide other financing in, in parallel. And I exemplified that with the, uh, the WACA program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time, so I just wanted to provide an opportunity for each of the speakers to um, add anything else, um, respond to any particular um, topics or questions, or just give a few final thoughts. Um, perhaps if we want to start with um, Megan. Sure. Um, yeah, just to add on to um, what the, um, the two other speakers were saying about um, 
different sources of finance. I think, you know, that's something that's quite rich uh, uh, for journalists to explore. Um, and I think it's actually very important as well, um, especially, you know, at a time when we don't have enough funding um, for some of these projects. I think I saw one or two questions in there about small scale funding. And I think, you know, like I, I said with the example of uh, the, the fishermen in Malaysia, that by writing about um, some of these projects um, that are having good impacts at the local level, but are really struggling to get enough money um, and attention that we can actually have some impact and that we can help to. Um, you know, uh, tell the rest of the world that these projects exist, but that they need more support. And, you know, um, I think it's up to us to, to, to sort of find these smaller stories as, as well as covering the bigger stories. So I would, you know, not be too intimidated as well by the whole climate finance label, um, because at the end of the day, uh, these are projects about climate and nature protection and that matter to local people as well as to, uh, uh, the planet, and so I think you know. Although these are stories about about money, um, and and that's necessary to get the work done. I think you know our job as journalists is 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 to tell the human side of it, and you know whether or not you find climate finance a scary subject, which a lot of people do. Um, you don't have to go at it from that angle. Um, you know, you, people people like Yaba and Peter will explain the financial side of it to you. <laughs> you go and talk to the people and, and tell us what's happening and they'll they'll help with the other stuff. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, Peter, over to you. Sure. Any I, final thoughts? It's really important we work with civil society and with journalists. And I think for, for us, as you saw Maggie explain, the interface or using journalists as a conduit to make the programs more sustainable and have accountability and unite as a group to help the countries because the countries, most of the countries don't have enough funding for all of that needs to be done for development. And it's important we use the money well that's available. So really, we embrace working with journalists and we look forward to continuing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maji, would you like to add anything? Yes, definitely. Just to add what uh, what Peter say, you know, uh, now in all this project, the the issue of inclusion is important, making sure that the, all levels of the communities are part of of the solutions, and uh, that's why we are with journalists. We you know we really invite the journalists to keep working with us to help us you know provide that platform. Uh, to make sure that everybody is including and also revisit. Uh, talking to Megan, she just find out four years ago, she did a project, a, a story on Waka. Now she's like, okay, four years later, what did you achieve? Let's go back, let's revisit and see what progress. So once you start on a story, just go back a few years later and see, you know, what is new, what else happened, how were livelihood transformed. So Megan, I'll, I'll come back to you so we can, um, go back to Senegal and see what happened to the people. Thank you. Yes, Maggie, yeah. that would be excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, I was really impressed when I, I heard about that element of your work under WACA. It's so important. And um, yeah, well done. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we'll talk. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Yeah, Yaba, over to you for any final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Lucien and everyone. I agree with what everyone has said. I mean, journalists, you, you are key in this in this um, fight for ensuring sustainability of our world. Um, without you, we cannot have all the tools that we need to raise the awareness that we need around the world to make the change actually happen. And you're also part of the memory that we need to keep um, in place now and into the future, because just as Maggie and Megan were talking, it's like going back to those stories, going back to what has happened in the past and how things has progressed is part of that memory that we need to keep um, very active and alive um, if we are to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Yaba. Yes, yeah, that memory is so important. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, to, especially to our panelists, our speakers. Uh, thanks to all the attendees. Just a reminder that everyone will receive the recording of this uh, webinar once we have that ready. And that will include um, the presenter's slides as well as contact information. I know we had a lot of questions that we didn't get to in our time. So feel free to, to reach out directly um, if you would like to, to get those questions answered. 
Also a reminder that we do have a, a feedback survey that was placed into the, the chat. Um, so please fill that out if, if you have the moment. Um, and thank you again so much for, for everyone's time. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank Everyone. you for organizing it. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.